So shalom, my friends. Here we are. We just finished learning the Chovas Levavas, and we're moving on to a new Sefer. And I was trying to think to myself, which Sefer do I want to teach? What can I give? And it's really the foundations, the beginning level of Yeshiva. Many people not religious, just starting out on their journey. And I wanted to choose something that could empower them. And my eye spotted on my bookshelf that I haven't taken down for a while an amazing Sefer called Bnei Machshava Tova. And I decided I have to learn this. But many people said to me, hold on, but that's really high level. You know, the, it, it was written only for the inner circle. I'm going to introduce it in a second. So how can we teach it to the, the very beginning people in yeshiva? And my answer is that often the goal is also the foundation. The goal of our avoda, the goal of our work, the goal of our life is also the foundation. For example, emuna. What's the goal of Judaism? The goal of Judaism is emunah, to know Hashem, to believe in Hashem, to trust in Hashem, to know that everything's for the best. So that's the goal, but it's also the whole foundation of, of Judaism. If we don't have this faith and trust, then we've got nothing to base anything on. Another thing is menuchat nefesh. I have an online mindfulness course, and the, one of the goals is menuchat nefesh, which means peace, inner peace, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual peace and connection. And that's the goal, but we need to taste a little bit of it at the beginning so that we can actually have the basis on which to work towards the goal. So I chose this safer because it's, it's the, the goal of our life, it's the goal of our avoda, it's the goal of our work, but we also have to get it understanding at the beginning. And by the way, you can tell this is just a recording because I recorded this whole class for, for all the people at my 9.30 class. And then later in the day, Someone came up to me and said the recording didn't work at all. So I'm just doing it again so that I can introduce people watching online to what we're doing. And in my classes, as you know, we always talk about greatness. You want to be a great person. And one of the greatest person, I believe, who has walked the face of this earth in the last 500 years at least, is Rabbi Kalonimus Kalman or Kalmish Shapiro, the Piazetz Nerebi. So he was born in 1889. Actually, the day after Lagba Omer, on the 20th of May, on Lagba Omer in Poland. And he was born to an amazing Hasidic family. And I then explained to the class, or I'll explain to you a little bit about what Hasidus is. Because some people think, oh, maybe it's kind of airy fairy type, not serious Torah, and they're just making stuff up. But really, what had happened to Judaism, because we were exiled from our holy land, and we were very disconnected from the, the Kedusha and the environment we needed to be in, and many of us were in Europe, it was very, very difficult life. And it was very, very cold. Just Obviously, just the, the weather and the environment was cold, and there were pogroms and crusades, and many Jews were poor and living in shtetls and surviving on bare minimum. And so... We lost a lot of our inner work in Judaism. We were just fighting to survive. Many people ask me, you know, you teach Jewish meditation, but we don't see that really in Judaism. Is it a new thing? Where, like, where did it go? And the truth is, it's an ancient tradition, but through those years of suffering and persecution, we really lost our connection to these deeper ideas and deeper teachings. And we can actually see in many Sephardi communities who didn't have to go through as much elongated suffering and persecution, they still have a deep Kabbalistic tradition. So Judaism in those days was really almost split between the more learned people and the simple people. And the Baal Shem Tov then came along. R Rav Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, he, he lived in, I think, born in 1535, 300 years ago, 34. And he realized, hold on, I, I need to bring the fire back into Judaism. I need to bring the life back into Judaism. I need to bring the warmth back into Judaism. And one of his major, major teachings was Tamimut. And it actually says in the Torah, Tamim Tiyem and Hashem Elkecha, that you need to be someone who is Tam. And what does Tamimut mean? Tamimut means simplicity and sincerity. There is an idea of the Tam at the Pesach Seder and that he's just naive. So it's not talking about that. It's just pure, a pure hearted, person who has the right motivations, who has the right aspirations, and is not overcomplicating things. Rabbi Nachman speaks about this a lot as well, that we should have pshitut batimimut. You should be pasha. Don't overcomplicate things and overthink things and overanalyze things. Just have emunah. Just do mitzvahs. Just work on your character traits. 
just speak to Hashem from a pure place in your heart. So the Baal Shem Tov gave a lot of effort, emphasis to the simple Jews, the ones who weren't so educated. Famous stories of the Baal Shem Tov, for example, they were davening. It was Yom Kippur, and they were praying the holiest day of the year. And suddenly they heard from the back of the shul, there was a kid, Aleph, Bed, Gimel, Dalid, Hey, and he was just shouting out the Aleph Bet and all the Hasidim, everyone getting a bit upset and annoyed with him. And they were like, shh, you're interrupting us. And the Baal Shem Tov stopped the davening. And he said, hold on, let's find out about this person. He went up to the kid and he said, what's your story? And he goes, well, I was an orphan. No one ever taught me to pray. No one ever taught me to learn Torah, but I do know the Aleph Bet. So I'm just screaming out to Hashem, Aleph Bet, and I'm saying to Hashem, Hashem, you just take the letters and you turn them into prayers. And the Baal Shem Tov smiled and he says, this is the most authentic prayer. This is the deepest place because it just comes from a pure heart. It just, no, no arrogance. It's just, prayer is called Avodah Shebelev. And he's just praying from his heart. Another story about the Baal Shem Tov, someone's playing the flute in Shul. And everyone stopped and they were upset. And, and the guy also said, I never learned. I didn't have the opportunity to go to Yeshiva, but I'm a shepherd and I play the flute. So my flute is my music and my music is my prayer. And once again, the Baal Shem Tov says, this is the highest. So one of the major ideas is that we're all equal. It says in the Gemara, Rahman al boy. Hashem wants your heart. He just wants you to be sincere and real. In, in the Shulchan Aruch, Sadiqet 98, it says your kavana when you pray should be you understand the words and you know who you're speaking to. That's it. Simple kavana. I know what I'm saying and I know who I'm saying it to. And then the Mishnah Bura, the Chavitz Chaim, says that there was a big mukubal and he knew all the different Kabbalistic intentions for every word in the prayer and the Hebrew Aleph Bet and all the amazing ideas and the gamachias. But when it comes to praying, he just prayed like a Tinok Ben Yoma. He just prayed like a little kid, a one-year-old kid. The other major, major thing that the Baal Shem Tov and the, the movement of Hasidut brought back was uh, Simcha. Just ivdu et Hashem basimcha, as David Melech says. Let's joyfully do what we're doing. Even in the Torah, it says that lots of bad things came upon the Jewish people because we did we did the stuff that we were doing, but there was no joy there. We were just kind of just ticking off the boxes and and doing what we had to do, but there's no simcha, and it seems a bit harsh. Why should we get punished if we did the right thing? Why should we get punished just because we didn't do basimcha? Because if we didn't do basimcha, that means there's no relationship. Because understanding that Judaism and mitzvahs and Torah and everything we're doing is a relationship and all the mitzvahs and halachas are an opportunity to invest in the relationship, then of course it should be basimcha. When my wife tells me what she likes, I like flowers, I like walking in the park, I'm very happy. I want to go for a walk in the park. I want to buy her flowers. So if we see the mitzvahs as burdens and obligations that we have to do to, to make Hashem happy, then and we're not doing it basimcha, we're missing the whole purpose. We're missing the whole point. So there's lots of singing and lots of dancing and lots of ruach. Another major idea is, is hislavu, hitlavut, hislavus, which means enthusiasm. How are we praying? How are we, it says, David Melech says, Kol tamana mocha. All of my bones are just calling out, who is like you, Hashem? So to pray with fire, with passion. So the Pirzetz Rebbe, he was born into this line. We had the Baal Shem Tov. Baal Shem Tov's main disciple was the Maggid of Mezrich, Dov Bear, the Maggid of Mezrich. And then he had 10 main disciples, including Rav Levi Yitzhak of Bidichev. I want to tell you 50 stories about him now, including Rav Elimelech of Lezinsk, Rav Zusha. They were brothers. I'll just tell you one quick story. This is like the most famous Hasidic story. Probably heard it, but it's, it gives so many good messages. Rav Zusha and Rav Elimelech, they were brothers. And they went on an enforced exile and they were walking through Europe, pretending to be beggars, but helping people do tshuva. It's like there's a there's a TV series in the 1970s called Kung Fu. And this Kung Fu master just used to walk around to different towns and villages. And when people were getting in trouble, he'd like save the day and then he'd walk off into the sunset. <laughs> Very romantic. So this is what Rav Zusha, Rav Eli Melech, they were walking around. Europe, just helping people do tshuva, telling the simple folk that, that Hashem loves their prayers and inspiring everyone. And they often got arrested because that's what happened when you were Jewish. You just got arrested for being Jewish. And one time they were sent to prison and they're in a big prison cell with all these Cossacks and non-Jewish 
people and it was getting later in the day and Rev Eli Melech was looking a bit upset. So Rev Zusha said to him, hey, brother, you know, why, what are you so upset about? And, and Eli Melech says, well, it's time to daven mincha. But there's a pish pot in the room. Now, the pish pot is a bucket. In the prisons back in those days, they didn't have flush toilets. So they had a bucket where all the prisoners would do what they did. And it was very stinky. So Rev Eli Melech says, look, I want to daven mincha, but I can't because of this bad smell. The Jewish law is that you can't dive in where there's a bad smell. So Rav Zushi looked at him and said, my, my holy brother, the same Shulchan Aruch that says you have to dive in Mincha says that if there's a bad smell, you can't dive in Mincha. So you are equally fulfilling Jewish law. In one way, you filled Jewish law by davening Mincha, and now you are fulfilling Jewish law by not davening Mincha. So Elimelech was so happy with this insight, and Zush and Elimelech, they got up, and they started dancing and jumping around, and they started dancing around the pish pot, and they're like, oh, yeah, they, 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 they were so happy at this amazing insight. The Cossacks are looking at these crazy Jews. They're like, what's going on? What's wrong with these people? But they didn't have anything better to do, so they also got up, and they held hands, and everyone was dancing around in the prison cell around the pish pot. Yay! So prison guard comes in and says to one of the Cossacks, what's going on? And they said, I don't know. So these crazy Jews have gone crazy. For some reason, they love the pish pot. And the prison guard looked at him and said, oh, yeah, they love the pish pot, do they? So he walked in and he picked up the bucket and he says, if you love it so much, I'm taking it away. And he walked out. At which point, Eli Melech started, started <laughs> very many good messages about your attitude to life and the opportunities you can open yourself up. So many beautiful stories. They actually say this idea because the Baal Shem Tov was not only an incredible storyteller and miracle worker and healer and Torah giant, um, but he used to speak to Eliyahu. And Nevi. There's very many amazing stories about the Baal Shem Tov. And there's an idea that if you, if you believe every story it says about the Baal Shem Tov, then you're a bit foolish. If you don't believe any of the stories, then you're a heretic. You're, you're cold. You're not spiritually connected. And it, it, actually, a different story about the Chavitz Chaim. The Chavitz Chaim once had to go to the court, a non-Jewish court, to defend some Jewish people. And he gave this whole speech in court, and it was all in Yiddish. And at the end of his speech, the judge said, uh, they're, they're innocent, these people are innocent. So everyone said to the judge, hold on, what are you talking about? You don't understand Yiddish, you haven't even had a translation yet. And, and the judge says, he said, I know, but whatever that guy said, I know it was true. <laughs> so what also happened was that everyone was speaking about the Chavitz Chaim to the judge beforehand. He's this amazing guy, and stories about him and and the judge said to them do you really believe every story and one of the Jews said to him well the truth is i don't know if i believe all of them but no one's telling stories like that about me <laughs> so there must be something about him who's telling these stories so there's rav zusha i'd like to tell you a hundred stories about rav zusha now not going to but will one day and there was the alter rebbe Started Chabad. So basically, the Magid of Medjic had these 10 disciples. Now, Eli Melech, Eli Melech, he had a disciple in the Seer of Lublin and the Yiddish and the more of a Shemesh. And out of this amazing family, basically, Rabbi Eli Melech was born Kalonimus Kalman Shapira. Now, by the time he was three years old, his father passed away. And he was already on a very high level of Torah learning and consciousness. And so they took him to Shul to say Kaddish for his father. And he wasn't saying Kaddish. And they said to him, hey, little Kolonimus, why, why aren't you saying Kaddish? And he said, how can I say Kaddish when I see my father sitting there in his normal place? You could see the soul. He was a very, very high soul. But what makes him so unique and stand out so much is that he was very into music and poetry and nature and art. He, he was a very, very lofty holy soul. So he used to compose, compose nigunim, lots of Shabbos nigunim. And he was the Rosh Hashiva by the time he was 20, he, he became he became the Rebbe. And then he opened up a Yeshiva by the time he was 23. But the way he taught was just full of so much love and so much fire. Lots of his books you hear, he says, Achi, my brother, my friend. And he was just so warm and and passionate. And he, he spoke about a lot about Hitler, but he spoke about meditation, about calming the mind, hashkata, 
and habata, different ways to calm the mind and observe the thoughts. So he was a very, very big, big soul. And he had many, many followers, many Hasidim, and in the yeshiva, and he was a Torah giant. And then the war broke out, and Piazetsna, very close to Warsaw. So all the Jews were shoved into the Warsaw ghetto. I don't think we can fully comprehend the conditions in the Warsaw ghetto. I believe it was two mile, one or two miles square, millions of people in there, starvation rations, at some point no rations, everyone's starving typhoid, people being shipped off to concentration camps. And he was the Rebbe, he was the rabbi of the Warsaw Ghetto. And he was there to uplift people and encourage people. He himself, he got very sick with typhoid. But he made sure there was a mikveh and he made sure there was weddings and he made sure there was Torah learning. And he just made the, sure that the life in the ghetto was as uplifting and holy as it could possibly be. And he wrote several books. Now, unbelievable books. The Chavod Talmidim, the duties of the students, he wrote for students to teach them about loving Torah and loving mitzvahs and working on their character traits. But he, he does it in such a relatable way. And he, there's no pressure and fear. He does it in a way just to make people love it and want to, a yearning. He often speaks about a yearning for connection and things that are going to, get us away from that. And in fact, the book became very, very famous. It's the only book that was printed in his lifetime, I believe. And they, it got sent out to many, many yeshivas. And, and at the time, there were people who were against the Hasidic movement, in a way. And the last three chapters of that book were quite Hasidic in nature. So some people said, I, we need the book. Everyone, everyone accepted the book. Some people said, I'm not going to have the last three chapters. But everyone saw the depth and the wisdom and the love and the understanding and the joy that he was teaching with. He also wrote Hachshavirs Avrechim. I'm actually posting on, on Spotify. I got a whole series of Hachshavirs Avrechim, which literally means preparing the newly married people, but it's for everyone. I taught it in Yeshiva, and it's just how to find emotion, how to find emotion in our praying, emotion in our lives, just to, to build that flame of desire and connection. And he wrote Derech HaMelech, and he wrote one of his other most famous books was called The Eish Kodesh. Now, The Eish Kodesh was from 1939 to 1942 in the ghetto, his, his ideas on the Pasha, his Divrei Torah on the Pasha. Now, if you read this book and you had no idea of the situation it was written in, it would still be a mind-blowing, amazing Sefer, an amazing book. But to hear what he's saying... When there's this death and destruction, his son was killed, and in fact, everyone's dying around him. And the amount of imuna and the faith and the strength and the power that he's speaking about, while his whole own world is crushing and falling down around him, you read these pieces and you see what a great human being. I actually got a photo of him. I want to show you a photo just for people who don't know what he looks like. Um, here we go. Yeah, here's the Rebbe. Got to get out of the way. The Rebbe. So what happened was it was coming to the time that there was the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and he buried lots of his manuscripts in a milk canister and he buried them and they were found after the war. They were found by a construction worker because he himself was shipped off to concentration camp. Eventually, he went to Traunicki camp. And he was murdered there. He was shot on November the 3rd, 1943, which was the 4th of Cheshvan. My son was born on the 5th of Cheshvan. Um, but he was, he was murdered on the 4th of Cheshvan. He was 54 years old. But he left this incredible legacy of, of amazing love and fiery passion and understanding and deep Torah. So the, the text I decided that we're going to be learning now is called B'nai Machshava Tova, which it means the society of, of positive mindfulness. B'nai Machshava Tova, and it was actually written in the 1920s as a kind of secret manuscript to, and he gave it out just his very close inner circle of Hasidim, 
And it was about building this little society, this community of people who were completely devoted to spiritual growth, to supporting each other. I don't know if you've seen the Dead Poet Society, <laughs> La Havdel, an amazing movie about this kind of hidden society of, of poets. And so it feels like that. He said, what we need to do is we have to have a chevre. We have to have a community. We have to have people working together and have with a structured growth and a society for us to be the ultimate of De Hashem, servants of Hashem, living with passion and, and understanding. So this is what we're going to be learning. Um, and I really just think it's the most important type of safer to learn because it's really talking about what's the purpose? What are we really here for? And how do we live that in the most conscious and joyful way? And and the fact that we need each other. We need to have a, a, a community, a chevre, to make sure that we're we're loving and supporting each other. As I just said, so we're going to have videos every, uh, I'm not sure, Monday and Wednesday, perhaps. And we're going to be going through the Sefer. It's a very short Sefer. And we're going to not only be going through the Sefer, but doing some practical work. And we're going to be this chevre. We're going to be this society of people of, of positive mindfulness, of consciousness, trying to become spiritually great with the guidance of the Rebbe of Kalanumus Kalmish Shapira, Bezrat Hashem, the Pirzetsna Rebbe.